With me today is the 1979 Coral UK champion and a star of stage and screen, um, known to millions as uh, the straight man of Big Break, Mr John Virgo. Welcome, John. Where's the applause? That would be a <laughs> well, we, big uh, intro, that. Yeah. It'll be taped and put on later. Oh, thanks, yes. thanks. But if, do you think, um, are you aware of the millions of viewers, young viewers, mm. who now tune into Big Break, who don't even know you used to play snooker? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm well aware. Uh, Jim Davis and I uh, appeared at some uh, function and the questions from the audience and one little lad said, can you play snooker? You know, so uh, yeah, it hits you straight in between the eyes, doesn't it? It's like everything else. I mean, uh, you, people, I mean, obviously forget that I used to be a player, but uh, that's how I got the job on Big Break. Well, and apart from the impersonations, I think. And a very, very good player as well. Because you were originally in my eyes anyway, part of the new Brat Pack that came along and changed the face of snooker. Yeah, well... Uh, I don't I, know about your, how you view it, but for yeah. me, there was the old brigade, John, Ver, uh, John Spencer, Ray Reardon, mm. and in most people's eyes there was also John Pullman and a few of the mm. other. The game was, was sort of petering along until all of a sudden there was a new input, a new injection of new blood into the game. Yeah, well, I think the game was getting popular. I mean, I would put the popularity, uh, or not the popularity, but the, the swing, if you like, uh, with Spencer and Reardon. Uh, you, you know, the likes of watching Joe Davis at the very end and then uh, John Pullman, as you say, Fred Davis on grandstand Saturday afternoons. The game, if it was going to succeed, needed a bit more than that. And uh, Spencer and Reardon, who were both English amateur champions, were playing these great matches all around the country. But they had a hard task uh, turning professional at the time. And, uh, you know, I think there was one quote from Fred Davis and probably Pullman. Why do we need these people, you know? Because there wasn't enough money to go around, really, was there? Why do we need, you mean, why do you need... Why did we need John Spencer and Ray Reardon oh, in, really? the, in the right. professional game? Oh, right. Yeah. And, and that was the problem. So, uh, but yeah, that was understandable because there was no money in the game. But then as soon as Spencer and Reardon uh, turned professional, and then a couple of years later, Alex Higgins appeared. Uh, the excitement and the enjoyment of snooker has now begun to spread, and snooker clubs were starting to open. And uh, I, I, th I think, I mean, it was once called My Rebels. It was nothing to do with me, really. Uh, the guy who opened the snooker club in Salford, who you know very well, Jeff Lomas, you know, said, uh, well, you're going to turn pro, but the way this is, there's only two players can go to Sheffield. He said, that can't be right. So I said, well, that's the way it is. Two now, qualifying spots. Yeah, two qualifying spots. Fourteen qualify and two to... And when you think of the people who turned pro at the time, it was like uh, myself, Patsy Fagan, Willie Thorne, Doug Mountjoy, Terry Griffiths was just around the corner. And they expected us all to play one another, knock each other out and get two spots at the Crucible. For weaker players, yeah, some of them. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, well, absolutely. People who, who, who never competed against anybody just turned pro to make up the numbers, really. Uh, so Jeff said, I think you should call an extraordinary general meeting and uh, try and get the seeding system changed. And, and uh, that's what happened. All of a sudden, it was Virgo's Rebels take on the association. You know? All right, I don't remember those days. All I remember was mm. that as a, a young player coming up, the names of John Virgo, Willie Thorne, Patsy Fagan, Doug Mountjoy were the, were the names that I looked up to. Obviously, Alex Higgins was already there to an extent. He was there, yeah. But you yeah. were the names of the young pack coming through that, were, mm. that really changed the game because I used to devour the snooker scene, the magazine, every mm. month. Mm. And you were, the, you were the, the, the heroes to the younger players. Whether you knew it or not, I don't know. Uh, well, I, I, I've always been pretty good at carrying on causes, you know what I mean? <laughs> I, but we're just fighting for what was right, really. And, of course, it, eventually... Uh, we did get our way and, and, and we won the vote so that uh, we could have, uh, I think it was eight qualifiers or something like that, which opened the game up dramatically from what it had been prior. What, what always amazed me about that time was, uh, I'm not having a go at John Spencer, because as I say, when there's not that much money about, you can understand people trying to protect their corner, if you like. Uh, but when we went into the meeting to try and get the uh, qualifying, you know, from two to eight, uh, I, John Spencer went up to Willie Thorne and nearly had him in tears saying, you know, you've ruined the game, you know, you Willie Thorne, you know, and Willie's come, what have we done and all that? I said, well, don't listen to him. But uh, it was understandable. Uh, 
Dennis Taylor went over to Roy Andrew Arthur and said, I'll give you 21 for a tenner. <laughs> Which I didn't really understand what that meant. Maybe Dennis was saying he was a better player than Roy Andrew Arthur. But that wasn't the point. The point was that if we wanted the game to be successful, it had to be fair and everybody had a chance. And I know you've got to protect your top players. Uh, and, and that was an important scenario for them to be at the Crucible. But not to the extent that people were just there because they turned pro to make up the numbers. You know. uh, but now we've gone full circle. and now we, we, The game is now totally open. Yeah, well, really. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, now it's as fair as it could possibly be. I don't think that was fair at all. I think that was just a panic uh, move by the association. They saw an overdraft and uh, thought, let's open the game, get two thousand pound off everybody who can hold the queue, and we'll and we'll be back in the black. Right. That was basically why they did it, and uh, it was a sad thing because I think every sport uh, needs an amateur game, and as soon as you open up the doors and say, if you've got a queue, £2,000, you can be a pro, then your grassroots disappear. I mean, uh, Tiger Woods, who won the Open, you know, I, mean, I, I was interested in reading what he was saying. But the highlight of his career was winning the, the US amateur golf thing, because you, you, you need goals to aim for. You know, all of a sudden now, if you're a good player in the snooker club, oh, he's going to be world champion. Mm. Well, that's a big goal to go for, isn't it? Well, I agree with you because I, I remember my amateur days with great fondness and, and really, even though I've had a lot of success as a professional, mm. it's about memories and, and how much enjoyment you get. And the amateur days were very enjoyable. Mm. Now, as you say, everybody's allowed to turn professional and everybody's obligated to turn professional now mm. because there is no amateur oh, game. There no. are no amateur players in a way. No, no, so no. therefore, there's no, f in a way, some of the fun's been taken out. And we had great fun. Yeah. In the early days, I seem to remember. Yeah, I mean, I remember you, well, well, well you probably didn't realise, but you were criticised because you turned professional before you'd really... I think you only entered the English Amateur once, didn't you? I, I didn't... You know, I mean, English OK, Amateur I mean, the right. talent was there and obviously the opportunity was there and the game, uh, but because it was now opening up, uh, I mean, how many games would you have to play to get to the, the Crucible Theatre? So it was there. Now these lads are turning pro and... Well, they're spending all summer qualifying and, uh, well, they're finishing up in a situation I don't think a, a lot of them will ever succeed at the game. So I don't really know what their, uh, what their goal is, what to play on television or something. I don't know. I find it very strange nowadays. I think my first, my first contact with you was either watching you at uh, the, the, the well-known to the snooker world, uh, Prestatin, the Pontins, oh, yeah, or, yeah, or possibly yeah, going yeah. to the club that was renowned in the north of England as the hotbed of snooker, which was Potter's, which was owned, as we say, by Jeff Lomas, one mm. of the early mm. Uh, mm. people in snooker. And that, they, that was an amazing club, Potter's. Um, well, it was, uh, that's where you said, but th that was because it had a strong amateur thing about it. I mean, apart, I, I mean, I wasn't a professional when Potter's opened. I turned pro just afterwards. But there was amateurs from all over the country that would go down to Potter's and uh, it was a great atmosphere and it was people who were trying to prove that they were going to be good. I mean, you played there as an amateur anyway, didn't you? you yeah. Know, and Jimmy uh, White yeah. played there Terry as an Griffiths amateur. Terry Griffiths has it, everybody. Yeah, but, but I don't think those... Uh, I mean, I know these clubs where they say, oh, they have tournaments every weekend, but they're all professionals now who play in these, whether they rank number 900 in the world or number 36, it doesn't matter, either. they're all pros and they're exposed to whatever the game's got to offer. I remember walking up the stairs to Potter's for a competition and playing in the competition mm. and it was full of all snooker fans and snooker people who were there to watch a oh, good yeah. game of snooker. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, all of a sudden it closed at 12 o'clock and reopened at 1 o'clock yeah. for a completely different life. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, he had a croupier license, Jeff, didn't he? So all the croupiers who finished work, uh, he, he got a special dispensation that he could open. But you had, to have, you had to be a croupier or someone who worked in a casino. And it would open until 6 o'clock in the morning. They're playing cards and... Cards, and everything. So the snooker tables turned, it turned into a, a, yeah. a casino. Yeah. Well, effectively it was, a casino. It was an unbelievable place. Uh, I always remember, because Alex Higgins used to I was to open, I was wide-eyed and like, yeah, I, just, yeah. I, never, I was naive as yeah. well. Alex Higgins used to go in there and, uh, and basically because I was involved with the club as well, uh, if, if, if I had an old trophy or something, you know, then I'd put it up behind the bar and 
Alex would come in, you know, and go, well, you know, babe, what's that? You know, oh, it's a t trophy John one, you know. Next, the next day he'd be in one of his, you know, and then... So we finished up with all these trophies, like when he won the Canadian Masters, his was up, you know. And there was one particular day, we were playing cards and he was losing, you know, and he, he could get upset, Alex, you know. I don't know if you ever knew that. <laughs> but, and he's gone, OK, that's it, babe. I'm taking my trophies out of here. I'm not coming. And he's got all these cups. And you know the stairs, don't you? Yeah. And all of a sudden, he's gone out the door, and everybody said, I'll leave him, you know. And then all of a sudden, you've heard this clattering of all this silverware down the stairs. Part of being a professional back in the 70s was that if you were a professional, you were obligated to entertain and do trick shots. Mm. And mm. you learnt your trade not just as a player, mm. but as an entertainer. Ten reds in front of the middle pocket. I'm going to try and do this to pop the black. And the way it works, quite simply, hit that red onto that one, that one in turn with that one, ten reds open up, and the black is through the middle of the ten reds into the middle pocket. Should work something like this. I think in those early days, uh, particularly when you turn professional, uh, there was probably, I think the, the UK might, I, I don't think the UK was there the first year I turned pro. Oh, it might have been, might have been. Uh, so there was two tournaments really. The others were invitations, you know, and it depends where, really at that time, it depends whether you're face fit, fitted or not. So your bread and butter, if you like, was done playing the holiday camps. I mean, the first year I turned pro, I got a Butlin's holiday circuit in Skegness and Clacton-on-Sea, you know, I used to do about a thousand miles a week <laughs> for 150 quid, you know. <laughs> And I used to do the... Petrol uh, prices, you made a net profit. Oh, it was unbelievable, pence. you know. And I used to have a loud hailer to try and describe the shot. Well, I didn't do it, the red coat did it. You know, he'd go, Johnny's now going to pot the pink in the corner pocket. <laughs> but because a loud hailer only goes to the people you're aiming at, he has, to, he has to explain it four times, you know. Uh, but that's what you had to do those days. And I, and I think that's the difference. When you played, you were trying to sell the game. You were trying to convince people that the game of snooker was worth watching. And of course, once it got popular and the money came into it, it was like, you didn't have to prove that anymore. I mean, it was there anyway. But uh, I, th I think, I'm, I'm, I'm not knocking the players today because I think they're absolutely superb. I, I really do. I mean, the talent, their ability and everything else, I, I, I just don't feel as though... They want to sell the game, uh, they, or they don't feel the need to, to sell the game, you know. I mean, even in your own way, uh, you sold the game. All right, might be that, you know, you've got people like Alex Higgins to play, yeah. which is the contrast, and Jimmy White. But then, if you were playing, I always remember you <laughs> once, it was so funny. You played Eugene Hughes in a tournament on the uh, ITV. Yeah, I remember. And uh, they, they came up to you and said, if it's not over after this next frame, we're going to pull you off, remember? Uh, but yeah, yes. Yeah. I <laughs> I, I'm not going to come out with the old joke, it's better than an orange. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> and you ran round the table, do you remember? Yes, to try and So they the wouldn't game pull you off. You ran round the table like Alex Higgins. <laughs> thought it was really funny, you know. But... That's what people were trying to do. I, as I say in the early days, sell the game. Whereas now I don't see it. You know, I see people who. Uh, don't get me wrong. I mean, I, I, as I say, I'm not knocking their ability. No, of course not. But all of a sudden, there's one or two of them that, that when they get to a position where the frame's over, just go, oh, you know, let's set them up again. And I don't see any. I don't, don't see a lot of class in that. And I don't see a lot of it being done for the spectators who, at the end of the day, whether they're spectating in the arena or at home on TV. They need to be entertained, don't they? They need someone to excite them. And I just don't see a lot of that happening now. You've entertained millions of people, and perhaps your biggest break in many ways um, was by what we all knew was a great uh, trick shot routine, mm. doing the impressions mm. that we'd seen for years mm. on the, on the mm. circuit. And it had everybody in stitches mm. doing an impression of Alex Higgins.
Okay. Blue. Pink and black. Same shot. World Championship, uh, a session finished early, and you did your routine mm. in front of millions of viewers for the first yeah. time. That must have been great fun. Well, it was unbelievable, really. I mean, you, you, well, I mean, it didn't happen to you as many times, well, not by a long chalk as it happened to me, but when you get knocked out in that first round at Sheffield, or the second round, you think, what am I going to do with 17 days now? Because I wasn't commentating for the BBC at the time. And Mike Watterson, who uh, run the tournament, said, uh, I believe you do some impersonation, but at the time, uh, the first impersonation I ever did was John Hargreaves. Remember the Stoke player? John thin Hargreaves. Thin as a rake. Well, remember he was John thin Hargreaves? as a rake. Yes. What did he used to do? Uh, I don't know what he used to do. He used to be a snooker player, didn't he? No. He's, he's, what did he? What was his trait, though? What, what was his? Um, he used to move his chin, didn't he? No, his not really. I mean, he, he, he just he always reminded me of one of these stick insects. But I used to do an impression of him anyway in Potters when he played right. there in the tournament. So someone said, hey, that's a good idea. What, what, how, how does Reardon do it? And then you do a bit of Reardon, then Higgins. And it developed from there. And Mike Watterson had heard that I could do these. And he said, would you go out, because uh, these matches are finishing a bit early, and do some impersonations, and I'll pay you. So that was it. I went there. And uh, I think because nobody had done it, you know, and it was, it was funny because nobody else had done it, I suppose. No one else has done it because if they did it, they'd be nicking my act. Yes, I suppose, yeah. Which doesn't seem to bother anyone else, but <laughs> <laughs> never bothered Willie. But anyway. <laughs> but uh, no, you, as I say, it was just funny, you know. And, and but you, uh, the, the funny thing is, I mean, as a snooker player, uh, 1979 Coral UK champion, mm. we'll talk about that later on, but mm. top class snooker player. Mm. Okay, certainly in in the 70s and, and early 80s, you were there or thereabouts and produced the goods. Mm. But there was part of me always felt as if you didn't really like what you were doing. But part of me thought he much prefers entertaining. That's his. That's where I think he's. Mm. He likes being there better. Mm. I think I had a problem. Uh, I, I I always wonder about uh, pressure and things like that. I had a problem. If I was in the snooker club playing for money, I was so relaxed and so in control. Whereas when I was out playing in a tournament, someone always said to me, it's harder playing in a match than playing for money. If you play for money and you get beat, you go back the next day and revise the handicap or you get another shot, you know. Whereas if you're playing in a match, you get that one chance and if you lose, you've got to wait a year, you know. And I don't know whether it was that or for whatever reason, but I, I, I don't think, apart from an odd occasion, that I ever played within 21 points of my normal game in a match. Uh, and obviously, I try to analyse why. And I, and I never really caught up the answer. The only thing I would say, that, and, and, and I'm still a great believer of this today, uh, you, you know, you see players, if you can start off in the first frame with a big break or a good shot, it settles you, doesn't it? I mean, you, you see yeah. it in, in every tournament. If someone can go in that first frame, it's like you don't have to prove to the audience why you're there. I, I just had the feeling, I, I just had to keep proving why I was there for whatever reason, you know. And uh, that's what let me down at the end of the day. I mean, I, I just put myself under so much pressure for whatever reason, I could never produce the never type of game go. that I was capable of, you know. You never let yourself go. Yeah, really. I'm yeah, I, I, well, I know the same feeling. We, yeah. I think we, everybody goes through it. Mm. But some, some people, I think perhaps some people are just lucky mm. that they can let themselves go enough. And, I think and I, I could have done it, to be honest with you. Do you know the player <coughs> I most <coughs> admire, and it's very easy to admire at the moment, because mm. he's our world champion as we speak. Mm. And I said at a, um, uh, an interview after he beat me once that I'd love to... I'd love to have my brain taken out to be able to play snooker. 
mm. a bit like how Mark plays. Not that he plays, but he hasn't mm. got a brain. It's nothing mm. to do with that. No. The fact that he can play as if he's turned mm. his brain off and he's just idling along yeah. and he's playing naturally without worrying oh, um, about um, it. Un 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 unbelievable. But if you could, if you had, mm. if you could have had Mark Williams' attitude, you felt you'd have been a far stronger player. Oh, I think so. I I also think you see that that, that we went through this period as well. I mean, I'm talking about playing. Now, now I used to have a bit of a reputation having a bad attitude, you know, chip on Would the show. Would never shoulder. have known. I know, chip on the show. But that aggression helped me get over my nerves and what have you. And I think that when the game became, if you like, respectable, you couldn't do that. You know, so I had to sort of keep it all in. Keeping it in just put me more on edge, you know. And I was never one that could have a drink when I was playing. I just didn't feel that that was the the thing to do, you know, a few people had a few pints of lager, you know. So I could never do that, so I've got all this pent-up emotion and I just had to keep it inside. When I was when I was in the snooker club, I'd, you know, really get aggressive with myself, you know. And I think that was a problem as well, you know. I, m maybe I should have uh, got banned a few times and got fined, you know. Maybe that's what Higgins did to release his... Because it is a hard game, yeah. as you know, when you're sat there with all this emotion inside you. No it's not like a boxer. You no. can't go out and chin on one, can you? You've just got to sit there and uh, try and control it. There again, there's people like Peter Ebden. Uh, punch the air and, and get yeah. rid of it that way. Dennis Taylor, a bit of a joke and a laugh. Yeah, yeah. Well, as I say, there's certain people who, who can do it. I mean, Peter Ebden, and yet how, how, how you know, criticised was he for that? Yeah. You know? and, and now he doesn't do it. And, and is his results suffering? I don't know. I think... Uh, but then your, your forte... Yeah, mm. uh, was as we all knew from from doing exhibitions with you as a, a sort of mm. sidekick to you. I mm. remember going down to Bournemouth mm. on many occasions to a gentleman down in Bournemouth called John Hughes. I think his name was Eastbourne. I think it was. Uh, yeah, yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. And um, and doing exhibitions where you had the crowd in absolute stitches. And we were mm. there as a young player, mm. but you take over the show and do all mm. the entertainment. Mm. And and you you'd like come alive. Yeah, well, well, I did be, because I didn't have all this pressure of. Uh, Wherever that comes from, you know, that you've got to win. It's the fear of losing at the end of the day, isn't it? Once that fear of losing or the fear I could go back the next day and play double or nothing with a guy, mm. then I'd relax and I, and I was fine, you know. I mean, it always amazes me, you know, when people say, oh, the great characters of the game, you know, always laughing and joking like yourself, you know. I was the most <laughs> serious snooker player in the world when I was out there playing. But obviously, when uh, the match was over, then uh, I... I was okay, you know, but I, I found it very hard. But talking about how, how difficult the game is, uh, I, I look at the players today, I don't know whether you do this, you know, because you were just after me, but I look at the modern era now and I think, I didn't think the game was that easy. No. You know, I really do. I mean, I look at Stephen Hendry and the breaks that he makes and... And I, I just didn't think it was that easy, you know. I mean, you make one mistake. I mean, I know, you know, we've all done it one mistake, and you did it in your era, uh, obviously, more than anybody. But there's about six or seven do it now, isn't there? Well, the, the 147 break used to be uh, an absolute yeah, uh, godsend to the television and used yeah. to be something that if you made one on television or even in the tournament, mm. it was something so special. Mm. Now you're expecting, like... Ten a, ten a year in competitive play. It's unbelievable. It is quite amazing. And, uh, and, and the, the worst thing for me, I'm in the commentary box and somebody misses a red, you know, and leaves them a long red on. And there's probably only about two reds open, you know. And I'm sat there and I, and, I, and I feel as though I want to say, well, it could cost him the frame. And I'm thinking, no, wait a minute, how can that reds. cost him the frame? And I'll tell you what, invariably, when these top players are on the top of the game, it does. It's quite amazing. And uh, as I say, I thought the game was harder than that. You certainly made it look easy on one occasion, regardless of the nerves, because, of course, you, you won the 1979 Coral UK Championship. Yeah, and, yeah. And you must have uh, got something right there. Well... Along the way. Yeah. Uh, a few things happened there. Uh, first of all, I was playing well. Uh, and it was a great incident with you, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. When you put your cue on the... Uh... Oh, I played you in the quarters, didn't I? Yeah, that's right. Well, it was one of my first ever tournaments, yeah. and um, I played in the quarters. Of course, it wasn't, snooker wasn't like it was uh, now, because there wasn't the barrier before the rows of seating, mm. I seem to remember. 
And I remember missing a shot. Mm. And, uh, and, and I was always quite I I in awe of you because you were always very serious and, and, and I was always worried about playing you because you were, you, you were sort of... Uh, I know you had, not a temper, but, you know, mm. I'm always aware of putting you off because mm. I knew you'd get upset if you, something mm. would put you off or the slightest thing could put you mm. off because you'd mm. always be going like that on the table mm. as if there was a bit of dust and put the, rolled the ball Everybody off. Everybody says that. I honestly bit of dust don't know there, that right? I ever did that. Everybody Every says that. Every time you miss a shot, you're going like that as if a bit of dust got over the ball. Anyway, that's well, a long time ago. It might have been a bit of dust. Well, it could have been, but... So I was always aware of that, of getting in your eye line or making sure, so I was frozen, right? Yeah. And all of a sudden, I've played a shot at the top end of the table, mm. and instead of walking back to the bottom end, as you would normally do now, mm. I sat in one of the, the, the punter's chairs, you know, mm. one of the public chairs, mm. to the side, in line with one of the black spots. And instead of having my cue in my hand, I put my cue on a row of chairs that weren't being mm. used, because it was obviously a great game and nobody was watching it. Yeah. And, um, about four chairs, I just laid my cue down. Mm. Because they were at a slant, and as you got down for your first shot, which was obviously a very important starting mm. shot, mm. the cue rolled down to the back of the chair, <laughs> oh, no. which was on metal. Mm. The back part was metal, it went clatter. Mm. And my, my heart, I just thought, I thought, if I put him off here, he's going to yeah. glare at me and I'm just going to go yeah. to dust, because you could glare mm. as well. Oh, I did have a glare. You did have a glare. Yeah. But I remember you saying to me after, you know, I was just praying you cleared up. I know. <laughs> I was pleased, please don't think it was deliberate. Yeah. But I'll tell you what happened, in, 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 in my opinion, because, I, you, you know, I, I, I reflect on things that had happened. And uh, I won the UK in 1979. But earlier on that year, I was in the semi-final of the World Championship. Uh, and I was drawn against Dennis Taylor. And uh, Terry Griffiths was playing Eddie Charlton. And... I don't know where you get these ideas from in your head, you know. Uh, but I thought I was the only player left, in it? Well, I was just about to say, you must have fancied your chances with... Oh, I thought I was an absolute certainty, you know. And, and I still had it in my head that we were trying to sell the game, you know. And Terry, uh, I, I mean, had played tremendous against Higgins in the... Uh, I think it was the first round. He'd beat Higgins 13-12. Higgins had made three centuries. And Terry had played... Real, Terry's first year at the Crucible. But after that, he was playing, I mean, his game against Eddie Charlton went on to about 2 o'clock in the morning, you know. <laughs> and Dennis, who I'd, I'd known from playing as an amateur, you know, I didn't really you feel that... You fancied your chances against Yeah, him. absolutely. And so I tried to play like Higgins. I, I mean, I know it's a stupid thing to say now. I just felt as though I was... It was time to... You know, just show how good I was or something. I mean, rather than think about winning the tournament, I've reflected on it, and I, you know, I could kick myself even now, you know. And uh, anyway, I got beat by Dennis Taylor, and Dennis got beat by Terry Griffiths in the final. So five months later, in the UK, I'm in the semi-final playing Dennis Taylor. And Terry's funny enough playing Higgins now. So there was no onus on me, but the onus had gone there. I knew what I'd done wrong. And all I wanted to do was just show them that... You could play a game. ...that I was going to win. So I beat Dennis 9-4 or something. And, of course, we all know what happened in the final. I'm leading Terry 11-7. Uh, I need another three for victory because it was best of 27 at the time. And I turned up late and forfeited two frames because I got there late. For the evening session? No, for the, the afternoon. For the afternoon session? We played three sessions then. Uh, Friday afternoon, Friday night, and Saturday afternoon. So but every session had started at two o'clock, but because it was on grandstand, they'd moved it to one. And you, but you weren't aware? And I wasn't there, no. Well, my manager at the time was Henry West, remember Henry? Yes. <laughs> he was running around threatening to, you know, assassinate everybody who'd done <laughs> the programme. But it was my fault. I didn't see it that way at the time, you know. And I was the first person, I think. To ever turn up late for a big doc framed? Yeah. And, uh... So now I'm 11-7, now it's 11-9 when I'm not hit a ball. Two frames interval. The only thing that worried me at that time, when I was introduced to the audience, they all booed me. Which was, you know, which was good for me in a way, because then it made me really angry, you know. I mean, yeah. that was, you know... I don't remember that. All I remember was, I, I remember that part, Terry being embarrassed. Yeah, well, we can all, I, I always remember, first of all, Terry came in at my dressing room. Uh, when it was 11, no, no, that's right, it was, it was 11 all now, come at the interval. Because he'd won the first, those two he'd frames. He'd won the first two frames. And Terry came up to me and said, shall we split the money? Right. But it wasn't money, I wasn't interested in the money, I, I, I'd never even thought about the money. 
I, I want it to be the UK champion. I'm playing the world champion in the final, so this is a big game for me. I, so I said, thanks, but no thanks, you know. Yeah. I might have even said, you ain't won this yet, because he, it came onto me like he'd, he was, he'd beat me. Yeah, he, he obviously felt bad that... Yeah, yeah, and, and, yeah. and, and we, we know Terry, I mean, he's a lovely guy, Terry, so he did feel bad, you know. Not as bad as I felt at the time, <laughs> I promise you. Anyway, cut a long story short, I've gone 13-12 behind, and then uh, I, I made a 50-odd break in the next frame, and I don't know how to this day, I still don't know how I made the break. 13, I want to beat him 14, 13. Uh, so Terry had won the world. He'd been runner-up in the, uh, the UK. Next tournament, the Benson Hedges, which I wasn't invited to play in, right? Terry won that, and there was this guy, John Carty. Do you remember him? John Carty. Wrote an article, Terry Griffiths, who only just missed out on the big treble, uh, but maybe he'd have won the UK if Virgo hadn't have turned up late. <laughs> and I could never work that out, because right. it was me who forwarded two frames, but... Basically, he was saying that I'd upset Terry, and that's why he didn't win the UK. It was a, it was a very risky ploy, if it was one. Yeah. yeah anyway, exactly. it took the shine off, uh, yes. and plus the fact, as we all know, the TV cameras went on strike half, halfway through that final session. <laughs> so there's no record oh, of... Uh, no. But anyway, there you go, you know. Actually, I remember, I don't think we played too much as, as professionals. Um, but we certainly played once when I think I was still an amateur and you may have been professional. Another incident that's just crossed my mind mm. where we were playing, I think you were giving me 14 start in the competition. Was um, this at Potter's? Was it? No, this was in the Northern Snooker oh, Centre Northern in Leeds. Oh, Northern Snooker Centre Leeds, yeah. Uh, with a, owned by a guy called Jim Williamson. Yeah, he used I remember. to have a big dog called Nelson that used to lie on the floor. Mm. And this was a big, big old uh, Great Dane, I think. I think he was I remember the dog. It was a yeah. massive dog. And it also, uh, it, he had massive testicles as well, right? Did and he? Used to, yes, he did. I always remember because he used to lie on the floor and the punters used to have to come in and trip over him to get in the door. Mm. And then they'd, have, then they'd, they'd be lucky not to kick these testicles as they walked to their table. Do, I never did, know, do you know, that. I just, oh, I remember something reminds dog. me. I remember the dog. I'm yeah. sure it was Nelson, I'm sure it was a great day. It was a massive thing. He used to walk mm. around and then slop He used to run the around on the parapet over yeah, the top of the and club, just used to yeah. drag them everywhere. But anyway, it's just another story. Um, but we played in the, in the, the pit at the Northern Snooker yeah. Centre, which was used for some of the pro well, celebrity yeah. competitions as yeah. well. Yeah. And I was playing you, and uh, it was a, one of the old referees. Um, his name will come to me. Oh, Alf Shaw. Alf Shaw. And this was in the day before the misrule had been finalised. Oh, I remember the shot. Okay. Now. And so all of a sudden you had me in a tremendous amount of trouble. Yeah. And the only way I could see to get out of trouble roll dead was weight. to roll. Uh, it was a red by the middle pocket. Just past the middle but I thought pocket. if I could go off a side cushion just before yeah. the middle pocket and roll onto that red and leave it tight, then mm. there was no ball you could pot. Mm. So I made what was a complete hash of this shot. Mm. And I went plop like that. And it, and it didn't even reach the red and, and you had a nice red on into the corner pocket. That red I think. Oh yes, possibly. Yeah. So you jumped out of your chair to get ready for the pot and I thought oh this could be the, you know, mm. the, the frame loser for me and you could go on to win the game. Mm. All of a sudden good old Alf, good old, good Alf. old Alf, he went before the misrule was now as it is, yeah. went I think you can do better than that Steve. And pick the ball Pick up. the white ball up and put it back again. Yeah. You are standing at the table, you want to yeah. kill him. Yeah. How long ago was that? Oh, I just remember this. Yeah, remember I remember this. it as well. I remember the I moment. Remember it, yeah. I remember it. I think you can do better than that. I thought, blimey, he's giving me another mm. chance here. And you, you want to have a, you want to fight him. You want to give him the biggest right hand. Well, I've, I've, you want to say, but, but, yeah. but, I, I've got yeah. a shot on. I mean, I'm sure. Uh, uh, by the way, I mean, he's I dead then now, played, I then played um, the perfect weighted shot and laid them tight on the red, and your face was a picture. Yeah. yeah. Do you well, remember that? I'm sure probably <laughs> wasn't the worst referee. Uh, I've ever been refereed by, but he was certainly in the top three. <laughs> he really was. I mean, he was. Uh, but he had a good voice, didn't he? He had a great voice. He had a good voice. I, 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 for my times. first ever match in the in the amateur championships was refereed by a gentleman who was, um, I think, about 120 years old, mm. and the white ball was touching a red, and and the, 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 my opponent said, "Are they touching?" And he got a packet of Rizzlers out. <laughs> And he got a Rizzler, and he put this Rizzler between the ball. He forced it between the two balls and mm. pulled it out again and said, no, you can get a fag paper for it. <laughs> Did he? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I always remember talking about referees. What about that guy who used to do a bit of refereeing at uh, Romford? That Mizzle was his name. Frank Mizzlebrook. 
Was that his name? Frank I only Mizzle. know him as Mizzle. And uh, there was that great story, wasn't there, when uh, he was at Pontins and Roy Connor, who was a, not a bad amateur, was he, Roy Connor? Good player. And the amateurs had come together with the pros, and he was drawn to play Ray Raiden upstairs uh, on one of the... Uh, Club tables, yeah. Yeah, the tables upstairs at Pontins, pressed at him. And uh, Mizzle seen Roy as he'd gone upstairs. He said, you want a referee, Roy? A referee for you? Yeah, all right then. So he got up there, and obviously we were Raiden playing up there. Everybody was crowded around the table. And Mizzle's come out again. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, would you please welcome semi finalists in the own counties, uh, quarter finalists in the London area, uh, one of the pairs in Ronnie Grossi's Snooker Centre in Neasden, Roy Connor. And Roy's come out a bit of a clap. And his opponent, Ray Raiden. <laughs> <laughs> and Ray Raiden's come out, he's gone, from nowhere actually. <laughs> I, I always felt that, that you were the first serious snooker player, really. Yeah? No, we used yeah. to play, and uh, as I say, that, that was the other downside, with the bread and butter being mainly exhibition work, you know, so you'd be travelling around the country, and uh, you just got in the habit of these late nights going for Indians or Chinese yeah. and nightclubs and this, that and the other. Uh, and, of course, Higgins was a great role model, and, and, I mean, let's be fair, I mean, Spencer and Reardon weren't far behind in the drinking stakes, were they? No, you know, they I mean, no, they were a, drinkers. That was the way so, it was, yes. So you thought, right, to be a proper world champion, <laughs> you've got to, you get got to have a drink. <laughs> I mean, it was that great story, wasn't it, about John Pullman was uh, playing John Dunning, and John Dunning had gone up from Yorkshire, and he sort of gone in the hotel the night before, and uh, he'd gone, oh, John Pullman, I'm John Dunning, I'm playing you, you know, tomorrow. Oh, hello, have a drink. <laughs> so anyway, he's had a drink. So they played the next day, and Pullman's beat him, and he's gone back to Yorkshire in the evening, and he said, uh, got beat then, John, you know, to John Dunning. He said, yeah, he said, good player, is he? He said, well, I don't know about a good player, he said, but he's a bloody champion drinker, you know, <laughs> which he was, and that's what they all were them days, weren't they, you know? And, uh, so we I was got, the first non-drinker? You were the first non-drinker, you know. I mean, instead of going to nightclubs, you were playing Space Invaders in the Grosvenor. You know, it was a bit of a culture shock. Well, that, well, the reason why it was only because I was like ugly and I, like, I couldn't get a t tug if I yeah, tried, okay, so I had yeah. to stay indoors. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. But um, well, I started off in a working men's club. Um, you started, you started in a snooker club, playing snooker. Yeah, yeah. I started off playing in the working men's club, and drinking when I first started playing. Yeah. So I did, I did have a alcohol in my body when I started pl practicing. It's only when I turned professional I thought I better not do that. Yeah, well, I wish I'd have thought that. <laughs> So in the end, that, that, that's what we do, you know. And, and, but, but what amazed me then, that, that all of a sudden, you, you get this tremendous success. Yeah. And it's like everybody wants to knock, knock you, don't they, you know. I mean, oh, Steve Davis winning this and winning that. And, and then all of a sudden, now you're not getting that success. I mean, you know, I mean, we played a few exhibitions this year, didn't we? Go yeah, out and the people yeah. just go wild. Yeah, it's, it's a really strange situation. It's this. unbelievable. But it's nice, that I think we, we both get a, a, similar, a similar sort of situation is that if you're around long enough, you become part of the furniture. It's quite nice as well. Well, you I think you've sold the seeds over the yeah. years, haven't you? you know, and, and, and people can trust you, if you like. I think that's an important thing, you know. And, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you, the, they'll all remember great moments that you gave them and whatever. And, I, uh, I re uh, that's nice. I remember a moment... Um, when uh, the worst possible thing that had ever happened to me in the world of snooker, certainly at the time, was losing to Dennis Taylor. Oh, the final and, one. Um, Dennis he, never mentions that now, you know. No, he never mentioned <laughs> no, it since, no. 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 Um, and the th even though I, partic I didn't particularly want to see you, you mm. poked your head in the door straight after the final mm. and went unlucky. Mm. And it meant a lot to me, even though I was still in tears, and mm. you wouldn't have known that I, it meant a lot to me. Mm. But it was a very really strange moment, because you, you've been quite... Um, you, you're quite a deep person in many ways, a, bit, a lot deeper than a lot of the snooker players around on the circuit. Mm. Um, but enough to care about other people and how they feel when they're playing. Yeah, and well. you cared a lot about Jimmy mm. White and, and what he's gone through in his career. Yeah. And you cared enough to come into mm. my dressing room afterwards. Mm. And it was like a nice touch, you mm. know, it really was. Well, I care about the game, you know. I mean, I don't only really care about players. I, I cared passionately. And I say it in the past tense because, uh, unfortunately, uh, we finished up with a game, to me, uh, that everybody who turned professional thought the game owed them a living. And uh, it doesn't. You know, sport depends on how well you do. And if you do well, 
I'm a great believer uh, that if you do well, then the reward should be great because that gives people coming up something to aim at. Uh, but I look at it now, and I know you're on the board now, and uh, I just feel we've gone too far down a road to appease all these people or players who was allowed to turn professional. We're never really going to make a contribution. And that's what concerns me about the future of the game. That I did feel very, and still feel passionate about, passionate enough to even think about it a, mm. quite a bit, you know. But uh, well, You're still involved in the world of snooker, uh, but talking of product that has been successful, mm. uh, and, and snooker's been very, very successful, mm. uh, so much so that a game show was invented mm. um, that was... S it was decided that it was good enough to mm. show on, on Absolute. BBC. Absolutely. And, and from very small beginnings, I suppose, has become mm. one of the most successful running game shows Britain's ever produced. Mm. And you've been involved in, in a completely different world. Well, it wasn't a completely different world. I mean, to me, I mean, Jim Davison's there, I just stand there, and, and, and I'm doing something that I know about. I'm talking about snooker, if it's calling out scores or talking to the players. But that, to me, was great. That proved once again that snooker was a, a game that is very popular with the British public. And, uh, you know, I mean, you, you get it, and, and I get it, you know. Oh, I don't watch snooker anymore, you know. It's gone off, hasn't it? You know, they don't show it on the television as much as they used to, but they do. And the viewing figures are still there. I just feel that no one's selling the game anymore to anybody, mm. and that, that's what concerns me. But big break... Uh, I thought it was great for the game, you know, and... Uh, I thought it was rubbish for the game and refused to go on for the first couple I know of series. You did. I, know I thought you it did. was going to be the worst thing for snooker. I know. And then all of a sudden I realised how popular it was, mm. uh, but also how much enjoyment the kids were getting from the game, and mm. re revised my... and said, I'm totally wrong here, this is, this is mm. great, this is, mm. this is in, encouraging people to, turn, mm. to play snooker. Mm just to bash the balls around, right. even if it's going to be fast. Well, when Big Break first came out, I remember the first one that was ever shown. It was on the Tuesday of the second week of the championship. And there was some girl in the Sheffield Star or something, uh, obviously trying to make a name for herself, and she criticised it as something terrible. And I thought, well, that's just one of these critics, you know, trying to establish something and get a job for one of the big newspapers. And all of a sudden, I pick up the London Evening Standard, and Alexander Clyde has done exactly the same. And he was a snooker correspondent for Pop Black at the time. And this show shouldn't be on television. Take it off. It's criminal. To, you know, it's going to ruin the game of snooker. And I thought, am I missing the point here, you know? But then you think, well, am I only thinking it's good because I'm involved and, you know... Anyway, thankfully, I was wrong. I, 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 I was right. The, yes. the, the game was good. It was promoting the game. And, and no matter what sport you're in, it needs promoting. And, and kids, I mean, I get them running up now six years old, you know, even younger, all got little waistcoats on and all that. And it, it's great, you know, anything that sells the game is good, you know. And of course, um, I, I don't think that I would have ever have conceived in my professional career, certainly when I turned professional, that I would have gr agreed to dress up as Mother yeah, Goose. true. And Stephen yeah. Hendry dress up as... Who did Stephen Hendry dress up I don't with? know. They've all dressed up in a few We've all dressed up in, yeah. in ridiculous yeah. pantomime gear yeah. for the charity show, for the Christmas show. I thought you looked good as Mother Goose. Ankles are a little bit thin. Maybe next time put a bit of padding around them, you know. But, yeah, I mean, uh, well, f funnily enough, that is... Uh, <clears throat> no matter how good Jim Davidson is, and, he, and he's a very funny man, as you know, and a, and, a, and a great, great comedian, you know, and so talented with his impersonation. It is the players that make big break. There's no doubt about that, you know. And, and particularly, and I'll, 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 I'll single yourself out, uh, whenever you've come along, I mean, you probably played one of the greatest shots I've ever seen in big break. Oh, yeah. That black. <laughs> well, it was I'm, unbelievable. With about two seconds to go, and I've gone, hit it now, and you just hit it. And lucky all you, it flew in the <laughs> middle of the pocket. You know, I walked away thinking, it could only happen to Steve Davis, <laughs> which is what we used to say in the 80s, wasn't it? Only Steve, you know. Uh, but when Jimmy comes on, and, 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 and Drago, Drago's superb when he comes on. Darren Morgan, I mean, he just wants to do so well, you know. And that's, what, that's what's made snooker great over the years. You, you know, you can rely on the players, you know. And... Uh, 
that's, well, that's good. Well, hopefully we can still rely on Big Break, uh, and uh, and hopefully you'll still be involved in it and be involved in snooker. It's been a pleasure having you, John. Thank nice you very to much. See you, Steve. Thank you. God bless. Cheers.